No country in the world can yet say that they have achieved gender equality. No one uh, in the 21st century should have to fight to gain the right to equality as a woman. I'm focusing on women's rights and girls' education because they're suffering the most. Right now, there are more than 62 million girls around the world who are not in school. We've closed the education gap in North America, but when you look more broadly, the Middle East, the MENA region, those expanses get much larger. Women are not making it to the top of any profession anywhere in the world. If we look at the Fortune 500, women are about 4% of the CEOs. The FTSE 100 in Great Britain is about 6%. We have not been able to crack that ceiling to effectively utilize the talent we have. There is an objectification, which is women don't have enough value to a film or a project, and hence they don't need to be paid as much as a man. When we talk about equal pay, when we look at it at the global level, men are making on average about $20,000 and women are making about $11,000. Anyone who's not being very proactive to ensure that their company is being thoughtful about the gender mix is simply going to fall behind. One of the priorities for you was to have a cabinet that was gender balanced. Why was that so important to you? Because it's 2015. <laughs> I know we have still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. Across the globe today, we see 19 women who serve as elected leaders as either head of government or head of state. When we look at parliaments, we're doing quite a bit better at 23%, and the trend line is in the right direction. My whole life has been one uh, around breaking glass ceilings myself uh, in the hope that uh, other women will also pass through the shards of glass to uh, take their position as full and equal participants in societies, politics, economies, with equal rights uh, and op opportunity under, under the law. More and more women today are coming alive, diversifying their career paths, defying the narrow expectations the world has in place for them. We want to end gender inequality. And to do this, we need everyone involved. Human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights once and for all. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for being here. My name is Enrique Acevedo. I work uh, for Univision, a US-based company and the largest Spanish language media platform in the world. I also work as a special correspondent for the Fusion Media Group, a company that was created on the power, around the power of, of diversity. Um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome audiences following us live on these platforms around the world. Um, we are also very excited that this panel is kicking off a um, new initiative. It's called Fusion Fights. Over the next few months, Fusion will be generating content that um, works to elevate the conversation around social justice issues, of course, gender equality, uh, gender justice at the center of that. We'll also be talking about economic justice, environmental justice, and civil rights. And we're kicking off that um, with this panel, so we're excited about that. Um, our discussion today is called Disrupting the Status Quo of Gender, uh, of Gender Roles. And I would like to start uh, with a personal note, something that doesn't happen very often here at Davos. Uh, my, my wife, Frontina, and I were expecting our first baby. Uh, we haven't told anyone but our friends, but now we're sharing that with you. I don't think she's very happy about it, but. <laughs> I only mention that because according to a new World Economic uh, Forum report, just released this week, our baby will be 83 years old by the time the gender gap is supposedly uh, closing. 83 years old, think about that. We have achieved a better understanding, uh, some consensus around the importance of gender equality, but we're not moving the needle fast enough. Uh, take the World Economic Forum as an example. Uh, they introduced a quota, a gender quota in 2011, and, and we have moved from five, nine percent of, of the total participants being uh, women at uh, the beginning of the decade. This year, we're close to 21%. So that's progress. And it takes courage to criticize, but it also takes courage to recognize when progress has been made. But this is not, this is not enough. 
21% uh, is not nearly enough. How do we move forward? How do we move faster? We have a great panel to discuss uh, that today. I want to welcome first Christian Lagarde, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund and the former Finance Minister of France. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Sure. Also, the Vice President and Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Relations Minister of, of Panama. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Isabel San Malo de Alvarado. Muchas gracias. And Robert Moritz, the Global Chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers International and a champion of inclusion and diversity in the workplace. We had the chance to, to talk before our panel and uh, I'm excited that you'll share some of those ideas with our audience here today. Uh, Charmin Obaid Shinoye, documentary filmmaker, one of Times Magazine's most, 100 most influential people. Uh, I don't want to name all the awards you've, you've received for your films, but they're most prestigious awards and, and, and consequential work in the documentary film uh, arena. And Cynthia Castro from Costa Rica, the vice president of RBA, Reinventing Business for All. We also had a conversation yesterday. Really enjoyed that, Cynthia, and I'm looking forward to also sharing those ideas with our audience here today. Let's start with the first question. Very simple. Madame Lagarde, how do we <laughs> move forward? How do we move faster uh, in achieving gender equality, gender parity in the world? You know, I have the privilege of being the oldest person on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I really welcome your theme, which has to do with disrupting the way in which uh, things are done and the way in which we try to close the gap and we try to break all the ceilings. Because we have been talking about it for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And it is not happening at the speed where it should happen. And unless your child was inadvertently born uh, about 80 years ago, which I doubt, <laughs> no. uh, the gap will not be closed when he or she is 83. The research conducted by the World Economic Forum shows that it will take 170 years at the way and at the speed it is going at the moment. By that I mean that we have improved gradually a little bit over the last, over the last two decades. But in the last few years, that progress has slowed down. And whether you look at... Uh, so uh, why is that? What do you think it has slowed down? Some of the factors. I, I personally think, and uh, you know, we, we, we are doing some research on that, I personally think that economic hardship is not conducive to tolerance, is not conducive to making space, is not conducive to encouraging uh, the inclusion which is needed uh, for women to participate at an equal level, everything being equal. So I think the, you know, since 2008, we have seen a, 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 a slowdown of the process by which the gap is closed. I was particularly concerned, happy but concerned, when at the G20 under Australian presidency back two years ago, decision was made to try to close by 25% the gap between men and women. Now, 25%. <laughs> in so many years is just not enough to actually reduce this basic inequality that is not conducive to good, inclusive economic growth, that is not uh, uh, allowing the reduction of inequality, which is not allowing the improvement of productivity, and which is not allowing a better sharing of good services and movement of people around the world. I'm talking from an economic point of view because that's what we are doing at the moment and the research that we try to push, which I think are critically important in order to move the needle decisively uh, in the direction of equality. And I'm looking forward to hearing some of your personal experiences in disrupting gender roles, which I, I'm sure you have a... Happy to. Uh, uh, something <laughs> sure. uh, uh, instead of following the normal order of the panel, I'm going to go one-on-one -on -one so, on, so Cynthia doesn't feel isolated all the way at the end. <laughs> Cynthia Castro, uh, share some, of us, uh, some thoughts about how do we move forward faster in your personal experience in Costa Rica. Okay. Well, with Reinventing Business for All, we work in a lot of rural communities and also in the, in the city all over Costa Rica, and I have some opportunities of working with women other places and with men. And something that is interesting is that I normally start my workshops telling people, imagine that power is a human being, imagine that power is a person. Close your eyes and imagine, how does power speak? How, how does power dress? And normally, about 80% of the people will tell me, well, he's a man in a suit, right? <laughs> so. One thing we have to know is that we've grown in this culture. That means we are all gender biased. 
even though we've studied it a lot, we've tried to to work and, and get that bias out, we are all gender biased because we, we grew in, in this culture and it is unconscious. The thing is that if we believe that power is a man, what happens with girls that are growing up thinking that power is a man? And for me, it's, it's amazing to be here. I, I'm really thankful with the World Economic Forum for, for creating Global Shapers and for creating this opportunity. Me sitting next to Christine Lagarde is like, wow, a dream come true. And I think I feel the same way, by the way. <laughs> yeah. We all feel the same way. And I'm thankful because, because even though I, I believe I'm an empowered woman, I never imagined and dreamed of this moment. And, what, and the World Economic Forum did did it for me. So they had a different concept of power. And until we don't change our concept of power, we won't be able to change it for other people. So we need a cultural revolution. And that is, there's different ways of doing that, that through education, through media, um, making movies, storytelling is so important because you can't aspire to be what you've never seen. So one way to disrupt gender bias is we need to change education. It, it's not possible having teachers in schools, right. high schools, colleges, and having people working in media that have no idea about anything that has to do with gender, that okay. they don't know what they are teaching other people and how they are affecting people's lives. Perfect, thank you so much, Cynthia. Uh, Madam Vice President, we say that women are underrepresented here at Davos, but Latin American women, we have two on our panel, are even more underrepresented, not only here at Davos, but probably around the world. Uh, any thoughts about that? Well, it's the same thing everywhere. You look at figures globally, you look at figures in the region, you look at figures in my country, and everywhere we have the same situation. You know, uh, uh, indicators can vary a little bit, but if you look at Panama, there's been advancement, of course, and there is more representation in terms of economic, social, and political positions, but it's still a huge gap. And in Panama, for example, for many years, more women are graduating from university than men. Two out of three women that graduate from the National University, uh, th three, uh, two out of three that graduate from the university are women. But when you look at the workforce, they are represented. 50% of the Panamanian workforce is women. But when you look at the executive positions and forget about the boards, you're just, we're just not there. So something needs to be done, definitely. And I'm gonna say something uh, that I, I never thought I would say because I really dislike quotas in general. Okay. Because women should have the opportunity to be in positions, not because of a quota, but because they have the merits, because there are enough women in this world that have the training, that have the experience, that have the capacity. But isn't that a good first step? I don't think it's gonna happen unless we have quotas. And okay. take that example, you being here at, the, at Davos, would this have happened if WEF had not decided to fund Global Shapers and define that 50% of Global Shapers would be women? It wouldn't have happened. So I'm starting to think maybe the only way of accelerating change has to do with quotas. What's going to happen with boards? When are we going to have, you know, boards and executive members of business take pride when they have one woman sitting at their board? It's something to be proud of when you have two. Come on. And not because it is right, but because it is sound business to have women represented. 50% of the population, 50% of the consumers, and I would bet more than 50% of the consumers, are women. So if you make decisions in terms of a company, having the position, the vision of 50% of a population, you will make better decisions for your business. But we don't, we don't, have, we don't understand that. We talk about it, and, and we hear about it, and we just continue to talk about it, and to hear that the trend has slowed down, it's heartbreaking. Right. It's heartbreaking and, and you know, we cannot wait 80 years or 170 or 50. Mm -hmm. We really need to do something and uh, I think culture is a big part, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think we need to do things on several fronts. Yes, certainly, certainly. Um, Sharmin, you've been telling the story of gender equality for, for a while now. Uh, share your experiences with us and what are we missing from this discussion? Look, um, 
women are excluded from decision making. Um, men sit around a table and decide for women. Until you have women sitting around a table and making decisions. So if you look, for example, um, uh, in Pakistan, um, I'm going to tell you a story about women who have decided to take things in their own hands and make decisions for themselves. In the Valley of Swat, there is an all-women council now. Uh, it's uh, run by a woman called Tabassum. She was a victim of child marriage herself. Um, for years, uh, women used to come to her with their sad stories and didn't know how to break out of the silence. Um, and so she got a group of women together and decided that we are going to make decisions for ourselves. And now they dispense justice. They, if they hear two sides of the story, they say, well, you know what? This is what your husband or this is what the men in the community have to do to make it right for you. And since they've started to do that, the violence in the village where she is has started to go down. So. I think that not only citizens and women have to take that step and be disruptive, but also governments. In Pakistan, for example, um, the Punjab government, which is a provincial government, had, has made it mandatory that 30% of all their boards are going to have women. Now, that is a first step. So that means that you have to have women on the boards, whether you like it or not. And you have to get women to, to you know, they say that there aren't enough qualified women. Well, you've got to give women the, the chance to sit on a board to experience that in order order to get the experience to be qualified. And not every man who sits on a board is qualified either. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> not making a point for not being qualified for those positions. But so it has to be both. The citizens have to take things in their own hands in some way. Women have to take things. But also the government has to partner with you in some way and take initiatives. Um, last but not least, Robert Moritz, uh, that was intentional, by the way. You are the only man on the panel. And I hope I'm qualified to be on the panel. <laughs> you know, anyone who's looked at, at, at your uh, trajectory with uh, diversity and uh, the importance of inclusion in the workforce knows that you're overqualified to be on this panel. But we said some, well, Madame Lagarde said something before we started our panel. Who's in the audience? And I see that it's mostly women. Uh, a lot of people are following the conversation on Facebook Live. There are. Uh, you know, sharing their comments. Most of them are also women. Right. Um, is this a women's rights issue, gender equality? Disrupting the status quo of gender roles depends on what women do or don't do? No. It's an issue for everybody. So let's go back. What we're trying to do here is accelerate the trends and accelerate the history that we're trying to change, going back to your yet to be newborn. And the only way you do that is through disruptive leadership. And that goes at the policy level, it goes at the business level as well. And I would love to be able to say, similar to yourself, Madam Vice President, that human behavior is well intended enough that they'll accelerate it on themselves, but they're not going to do it. It's not naturally going to happen. So let's stick with the board conversation for a second. We did a study recently. We talked about the value of diversity in the boardroom. And we asked the question of the female board members versus the male board members, how many of you value diversity in the boardroom? And it was polar opposite. The males did not value the concept of diversity in the boardroom. And if the males are dominating the boardroom, how are we actually going to get the selection of women into the boardroom? There are plenty of women, women qualified to be in a boardroom. The second thing is actually the women truly value that, but they don't have enough of a voice and being at the table to help make those decisions. And that goes at the corporate level as well as it goes at government levels, depending on where you are around the world. So I'm with you. I'm not sure I would love to be able to say that let's not go to quotas, but you absolutely need programs to be a counterforce, a counterforce to the natural human behavior that may be well intended, but it's not going to accelerate history at the level we're talking about right now. And I do think, back to your opening question, this is why PwC, we were one of these founding members for He for She, yes. which what Emma Watson talked about on the panel, if the males are not in the conversation, we've missed it. Because we're talking today, the panelists today, we're the converted already. The people in the room are already advocates, i got to imagine. Mm -hmm. There's probably not anybody in the room that needs to be convinced. The story's already been told. The question is, how do you actually tell not the story, but rather get to the actions that are needed? And that's where I think programs are in place that have to actually make this come to life. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And something that also came up before we um, got on stage was the fact that now that internet permeates everything, uh, this conversation also has to happen online, right? In parts of the world, 70%, 70 per, uh, 75 percent of women say they've been subject to some sort of cyber violence that very often traduces into physical violence. It's not a safe, positive place for women in many places around the world. How do we push gender equality also in our interactions online with you know, uh, using technology maybe to further this purpose? Um, and I'll start with Cynthia. <laughs> 
Well, my experience is more in the business sector in general, not just uh, technology. So what we're doing is, even though certain um, public policies are, are not there yet in Costa Rica, the INAMU, which is the Ministry of Women Rights in Costa Rica, created a gender parity certification. So what we're doing is we are finding all the gender gaps in every organization, and that can be a corporation, but that can also be um, any, any institution of the government. So we check, they have to show us actually their salaries, like what are they paying everybody, and we see if there's a gap there. What are the gaps in maternity, paternity leave? What are, um, is there sexual harassment? And what is the process they have against sexual harassment? What is the capability that people on the decision-making positions have about knowing about gender and knowing about biases? How is the gender bias in the recruitment process? Are they leaving the names in the pictures of the candidates when they're hiring? Or are they taking that off just to avoid any, any type of bias? Because you can't be gender blind in 2017. You have to be gender smart. Companies need to be aware that biases exist, that there will never be a company that has no gender gap, and that and, and knowing that, you cannot ignore, ignore your gaps. You have to identify them, you have to measure them in order for you to be able to make a plan to close those gaps, and you have to, to measure and check how you're doing every year. So this is what we're doing in Costa Rica. Every year there's a third party that comes in and checks how those gender gaps are advancing, and um, the, the company receives a certification. There's a lot of information on building the business case of why this makes a company more profitable. But also I think the next point and what we really have to work on is educating consumers. Just as you check if a product you're buying is environmental friendly, you want to check if a company that you're buying their products are are gender responsible and gender responsive because we've been talking about being responsive during th this meeting. So it's not enough and we've been talking for years now of, of what's our role and what is our, our responsibility, but what are we really doing? And just to add about the part of, yeah. of men, um, I believe we still have a part missing because I, I think it's not only he for she, I think it's he for all and it's he for he because gender inequality affects men also. And a lot of the time, men don't participate in this conversation because they think it's a, an issue about women. And they're not aware that culture is also making them prisoners because th they have to be the provider, the protector, they have to have this emotional shield. And there are consequences for men. We become more depressed, m men suicide more. So there's a lot of consequences also of how we are educating ourselves of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman in our culture. And how do we speed up this process using technology, Madame Lagarde? Maybe technology is a good uh, tool right now to speed up uh, the, the disruption of gender roles. You know, I'm not the ultimate expert on technology, so I, I, I don't want to be out of my depth. Uh, what I know anecdotally is that um, the use of technology in India, for instance, I don't know if we have anybody from India in the, in the audience, uh, in rural areas of India, for instance, has been tremendous in order to help women resist domestic violence, where it used to be the case, the only uh, you know, support and help that they could get in case of domestic violence was to go to the, to the mother-in-law. Right. Well, not much support was to be expected, of course. <laughs> Whereas having actually a cell phone that you can use and to reach out to your own parents and to friends and to people who will actually support you genuinely has actually been an improvement. But this is very anecdot anecdotal and I don't want to draw from that. What I can tell you from my personal experience is that Having raised uh, children and being a grandmother now, I can see that my, my daughter-in-law is actually using technologies in a much smarter way than whatever I was using at the time to actually free up time, make sure that she can mind her business and her professional activity while also checking on her husband to make sure that he's actually picking up the kids at school <laughs> and, and doing the right things that he should be doing in order to support and take his share of the, you know, the sort of parental work, I'm not saying, you know, uh, mother work or father work, but parental work. And that is quite efficient, actually. Um, so no, that's sense. just yeah, yeah. very personal. Enrique, the, um, well, yeah. the thing I would say is 
you started off the conversation around the negative on technology. I think it's important to address that issue as well, but it seems like the technology these days is getting more of a negative play than it is a positive play, to Christine's point. So when we think about technology, there's an opportunity to actually think about how do you manage your collective life a little bit better with the opportunities that are there. Uh, it allows for transparency around job opportunities. Um, if you look at the workforce and the academic studies in terms of how many people may not be full-time employees but part-time employees, crowdsourcing jobs through technology and apps is actually another positive that comes through. The other element with technology, though, which actually provides you the data, is where you see the discriminations and the unconscious or conscious biases that might be coming through. So again, just to give you another stat, we went through a large study, even though we do accounting, consulting, and tax, we're more of a human capital machine in terms of the learnings that we have. When women leave for pregnancy and maternity and the like and come back to the workforce, statistically, in the ratings when they're evaluated because they're out of sight, out of mind, they're actually reduced one or two levels in terms of their performance, but they never did anything differently to justify the decrease in performance which tells you then the program perhaps that put in place is maybe take them out of or do an intervention to avoid that automatic deterioration. And there's got to be an intervention so, to make that happen. Is it OK if I follow up? Please. What, what, what as an organization did you do with that research? You changed your policies in terms of how you did the evaluation, okay. the processes, and you brought in unconscious bias before the evaluations were done to change the human mindset to make this come to life. And that's what I mean by policies and procedures and the data is there for us now around the world in all kinds of countries in terms of the opportunities, particularly from a, I'm obviously speaking from more of a corporate perspective, a private sector perspective, but that's where we've got to use this more pinpoint, pinpointedly. And on top of that, you can get to the individuals now that perhaps are sending those yeah. wrong messages by the data from the information, structured or unstructured, to actually then have an intervention with them one-on-one. -on -one. So using data wisely as a... As a as Absolutely. A, yeah. And that goes back to the intervention and the disruptive leadership that's needed to make this happen. Yeah. Um, Charmaine, uh, going back to your experience in storytelling, is there a common denominator in the stories that you've been uh, following? Of course, you know, gender equality as a major theme, but in the lives of these women, in the lives of these girls, that you could see there's an opportunity to, to make this small but very impactful change um, and, and that would speed up things. Look, the world is, is completely changing now. You can't hold back women. It's just not possible because the cell phone has made it impossible to do so, um, especially countries like Pakistan, um, where the penetration of cell phone is 125 million uh, subscribers. Uh, we have 30% uh, of those are now using um, Chinese phones that have access to data. So, you know, for an average woman who probably didn't know about her rights or didn't know, um, is now has access to that. Women are starting their own businesses, sitting from their own homes, using uh, social media. Um, you know, they're forming networks online, whether it is about domestic violence or whether it's about rape. I mean, so there is a camaraderie that technology is allowing women to come around. And I think that um, the biggest problem is going to be that the old guard in many countries, the, the, the men who hold power are going to resist. And that is why in many countries you're seeing there's a surge in violence against women. And it's, it's simply because women are now saying enough is enough and we want to move forward and this is our right and we know how to do so. And, and when a woman says that, it, it makes a lot of men afraid because the world that they know is about to collapse. And that's why I think now more than ever, we are going to see faster the changes in women, what they ask for and what they get because they're no longer going to say it is okay for you to say no because they're ready to say yes. Do you perceive this fear, this fear of uh, change in Panama, for example, when you uh started your vice presidency, did you get that resistance from, 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 from men in Panama or, um, or women? I, I think hope that, that spaces would be, would, would be open. Uh, but I want to mention the opportunities that technology offer, yes. going back to what has been said. And I think technology is a great, powerful tool to model uh, things. And technology might not be helping us because it's also a way of, of portraying the role model of, of power as we know it mm -hmm. and the role model of women, which is used violently sometimes. I think we need to concentrate on using technology as a way of carrying information and thinking about Panama. I'm thinking, for example, of what our culture represents in terms of uh, sexual and reproductive rights. 
our culture is, is, is one that limits and hinders women from having family planning uh, information. And so the result is that uh, many teenage girls are, are getting pregnant. And this has been happening forever. It just continues to happen. And, and in countries like mine, we still have people arguing against uh, information for women to plan their lives and, and be responsible about it. How about using technology, for example? And I think that that's an area where, where filmmaking can happen, where media has a powerful uh, opportunity, and, uh, and, and where we all need to be more conscious. conscious. And, and maybe there also some sort of policies to, to arrange things uh, What do you different. mean by that, buying online? For example. OK. For Go example. But, but so you using technology to, um, in a way, uh, change cultural heritage and how that limits gender equality. Family planning information, yeah. okay. prevent an, an unwanted pregnancy. Uh, uh, think basic things that, to us, is information that's available, and you wouldn't think that for some women it's just not, but for many women it's not particularly poor women in rural areas, in indigenous areas, and everybody has a cell phone. Right. Nowadays, everybody has a cell phone. But this information that for many of us has been taken for granted for poor girls and for poor women is unknown. And it just perpetuates poverty and, and, and this circle in which they are growing up. Uh, I'm going to encourage uh, our audience, if they have a question, we will get to your questions. We'll have a, uh, some time at the end for that. Also online, a lot of people are uh, asking us about uh, how do you, in your personal lives, you know, with the women uh, that, that are part of your, your life, uh, of your uh, workplace, how do you empower them and, and, and preach with the example of what we're saying in, in this panel? Um, that's a question from our Facebook Live audience. Um, uh, Madame Lagarde, I'll start with you again. At the IMF, for example. Well, at the IMF, we have um, quotas, and we have very, very granular quotas, because to say that you want to reach uh, parity is not sufficient. You have to sort of go into each and every grade, each and every categories, and not only uh, witness the rise of women in the lowest part in terms of hierarchy, but make sure that it continues throughout. Equally, you need to see that it's not just the young women who are having access, but they continue to have access going forward post-pregnancy and young children's uh, uh, time, which is typically the, the, the place where you have the massive dropout. So we do have quotas. Uh, we, do, we have reached uh, our objectives. Not in all categories, I have to say, and it's particularly hard. You know, it's all very well proclaiming that uh, quotas are needed, but actually delivering on the quotas that right. are defined in a very strict way is difficult. And we have categories where, given the size of our organization, its demographics, and its lack of growth, in the next five years, in order to reach the quota, we should hire women only, which is, which is fine. But you have to deal with the other side, where some talented young man or talented not so young man say, well, what about me? I'm doing my best and I'm trying to progress and I'm you know, checking all the box and providing all the hard work that you expect me to provide, and yet I will not be given a chance. So it's, it's not always an easy task and one where sometimes you have to uh, mitigate, compromise, find ways in which you respond to the legitimate needs of those who have been excluded for many, many years without creating new exclusions that are going to harm going forward. Because at the end of the day, you want men and women to participate and contribute to the well-being of organizations, of corporates, and of nations, including at political uh, levels. I'm feeling off a comment that was said. Can I just say one more yes, thing? Yes, please. <laughs> when, when you are in a position of power, and I'm sure that there are many women in the room who are in that position of power, I think it's our responsibility to try to help others progress along the way. And we don't always do that, let's face it. So we have to identify the own biases that we carry with ourselves. And we have to gently, you know, when you sit, when you share a board, as, as many of you I'm sure do, sometimes you have to identify that when a board member who happens to be a woman, luckily, takes the floor, guess what? Many of the male board members will start 
withdrawing physically. Observe the body language. <laughs> it's obvious. Or they start looking at the thing. <laughs> or they start sort of saying, you know, when you're the chair, you say, hey, somebody is talking. You should be listening. Don't look at your papers. It's for everybody. So uh, we, we need to, yes. to disrupt the normal <laughs> way in which <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Engage. Um, uh, also, the, the expectation of success seems to be different for men and women, right? A uh, successful man probably just uh, is someone that achieves a good position at work or makes a lot of money, and that somehow seems enough. But when a, when a woman is in that position, then questions arise about, is she a good wife? Is she a good mother? <laughs> Did she you know, have to leave those responsibilities or yeah. uh, negotiate those responsibilities to gain this. Uh, uh, I'm going to go to Cynthia and then back to you, Madam Vice President, and then we'll start uh, again with Charmin and, and Bob. Sorry about that. <laughs> Cynthia. Yeah, so Christine was mentioning about how we have to have equal opportunities in politics, economy, in the business, but I believe we have to have equal opportunities also in the household. And Still, the ma major responsibility of everything done at home and, and taking care of children and, and parents when they grow old is still in the hands of, of women. In Costa Rica, we had a study of how, mu how much time women were investing in household activities. It was about 37 hours a week versus men 15 hours a week, so it's yeah. twice. So until we change those, those ideas about success, we won't have an opportunity to divide 50-50% those responsibilities at home because, for, for, because success for a woman has to do with maternity, has to do with family, with getting married, and for a man, with, with business, with money. And so if he's a good father, people won't see him as successful. And that's why I believe that Part of, of this conversation, what's really important, is paternity leave also. Right now, um, I'm 31 years old. I was speaking the other day to, to several friends because they asked me to do an article on why are we getting married after 30. And we were all speaking, we're like, well, because we feel like we have to choose. Like we have to choose between our career and, and having a family. Because right now, even though if I find a partner that wants to do 50% of the work at home, he doesn't have the support by law to take time off and take care of his responsibilities. So it all would fall on me. So, so it is important to change that, that idea of success for men also. Um, Bob, how do you empower the women in your life? Yeah. So two stories, you said make it personal. Um, when I came into my previous role, which is a US leader, um, I brought a number of women into the leadership team, and to Christine's point, but a little counter, in the very first meeting, you saw the male talking. And the, the number of women in the room were not speaking up. So literally, I got up to get a cup of coffee, and I walked behind one of them in particular. I said, you're in the room for the reason. I, lead it, I asked you to be in this room. I know you can speak up. You've got points of view. I've got your back to get her to have the confidence to go speak. And this is the, the challenge, I think, for, again, I'll go back to the, the opening theme I gave, which is the, the men in the organization. Are they creating the opportunities, and are they giving the confidence to the women to actually go do the things that they need to do? And I think it's important for us. That's what I meant by disruptive. Now, let's talk about another disruptive example. Um, a number of years later, I thought about changing a leader uh, in the middle management of our organization. And a couple of people came in the room, and they talked about the candidates, and we have a requirement you have to bring in you know, some gender into the conversation. You have to have an equal number of male and women as we have, they have dialogue. But the men were justifying why this particular woman is not qualified, right? So I happen to know this woman, but they don't know I know this woman, all right? So we went through this debate of which they said, well, she's not familiar with the business. I said, well, do you know that she actually taught me the business? Because actually she was in the business a number of years ago. We have since transferred to her to give her more opportunity. <laughs> Then they went down a line of thinking of saying, well, hold on, she had a personal issue to deal with. We're not sure she's going to have the time to do it. And they just assumed. And I said, hold on, has anybody talked to her? And I'm myself willing to pick up the phone and talk to her. 
And the point I'm making here is that unless leaders visibly and proactively do the disruption to change the mindset, the next time that team comes in, they'll know to behave a little differently. If I did that behind the scenes, I bet you it still wouldn't happen and wouldn't have gotten the storytelling in the organization to create opportunity and to give women the confidence to be successful and do the things they need to do. Sure. I mean, you know, um, women, even if they're very, very success, <laughs> successful and at the top of the thing, very often the question that they get asked is, how do you juggle family life and, and work? I mean, how many men get yeah, asked, how many male CEOs get asked, how do you juggle being a CEO and having a family? I mean, it's this, it's this bias that we all have and it's everywhere. And I think that it, it's, it has to change, but it has to change not, not because, um, of, of the way society uh, looks at us. But I think that each one of us has to change. I refuse to answer that question when people ask me. I do not answer it. And I no longer answer the question, what does it feel like to be a female filmmaker? I am a filmmaker. What's a female filmmaker? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> And a very good one. <laughs> yeah, no, so, so, so you know, th those are things. But, but I think that there are there are certain things that that force women uh, completely out of the the workforce. So you might be very educated, but in many of the societies we 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 live in, sexual harassment at the workplace right. is a very major issue. Okay, and there might be laws that that exist for it, but how many women have the courage to report it and forward it and fight the system? And I think that those are very real issues. So maternity leave is one one issue because it takes you out of the workforce, sometimes at a critical time in your life, but sexual harassment, and many young women that I speak to say that it has really changed the way. They'd rather not go to work than have to deal with that constantly. And you might, some people might not even acknowledge it to be sexual harassment, but it very much is sexual harassment. Yeah, yeah. Um, Madam Vice President, um, I, I also wanted to ask you about, you know, how does it like to be a female? No, of course not. <laughs> Of course I'm not going to do that. No, no. Let's talk politics for a second. <laughs> Something less controversial. Um, like the election of the first African-American president didn't change racial tensions in the US, the possibility of having the first woman being elected as a, as a president in the US wasn't going to change gender equality issues. But my question is, having uh, a man like the president-elect Donald Trump, who has expressed uh, the way he has about women. Does that hurt the cause of uh, gender equality? Not only in the US, what, but around the world. Why would I get this question? <laughs> they, they, <laughs> I'm foreign minister. <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe, maybe, maybe that's why. I think that messages are important. Messages are powerful. And messages from powerful people are very powerful. So we, we need to pay attention and we need to continue to work on messages being um, gender correct, I think that's part of the of the of the what we have ahead. And I think as uh, as leaders from the private sector or from the public sector, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to 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 lead, and we have a challenge here on gender. Uh, participation, uh, equality, and we need to take note of that and work towards the solution. Uh, and there are many ways from a position of power where you can work at that. Be that your immediate group of people and, and you mention what we each of us do. I have noticed uh, that from my support staff, for example, um, it's, it's a lot easier for my male support staff to sit at the table. And my female support staff might tend to sit behind. Mm -hmm. And I have, and I take that from Sheryl Sandberg's book. Mm -hmm. I make a point of inviting them to sit at the table. I think each of us has the opportunity of taking uh, that mentoring, right. uh, be that we are men or women, and, and maybe not necessarily in a powerful position, but if we, teach, if we take care of people around us and just give them that little push, and it has to be constant. It has to be constant. And I want to share a personal note. Please. And uh, my daughter is probably going to kill me, but anyhow. <laughs> and I want to share it because I think as women, we have a huge responsibility on the culture that we continue to 
portray and continue to encourage, not consciously. Uh, I've, I've always been uh, uh, a professional, uh, but I've always taken care of my family and done the role that we are expected um, to do. And my husband has always been very present uh, as, a, as a husband, as a father, but I've always managed what was expected for me to, to manage. When I took office, well, my life was a little bit disrupted and my daughter needed to go to the doctor and we were sitting around the dining table and I told her, the appointment is made, you're going tomorrow at three o'clock and daddy is taking you. And she asked, but will he know what to say to the doctor? <laughs> and my husband was sitting right there. And he goes, I'm sitting right here. You cannot speak as if I wasn't. And why does that happen? Because I never, I never let him before. I, I mean, it, it was just part of what my uh, trained, and we need to work at that. Many times, uh, men don't take on some uh, roles because we don't let them. Okay. Point. You wanted to add something? I, I just wanted to add, it, it's, you know, as part of the, the tips and the things that we can do to, uh, to help. When I was finance minister, um, very often president of companies would come and would report on their strategy. And I would ask them about the board composition because it was in the air that women should be part of the boards. And they would always say, you know, I would love to have a woman on the board. <laughs> I just can't find any, and the only ones that I know of are already completely overbooked. So I used to have a little piece of paper in my pocket <laughs> with the list of the 20 names of those women who I knew were fully competent and willing to serve on boards, because that is just, you know, okay, all right, if the minister says so, you know, you just have to do it. One more point, and that goes to your issue about uh, sexual harassment. We, together with World, the World Bank, we, we conducted a study of about discrimination against women in the legal systems of uh, the anti-membership. So you're talking about nearly 180 countries. And we were really surprised to see that over 90%, 9-0, so 90% of all countries in the world still have in their legal system, whether by virtue of their constitution or in the legal system uh, itself. Restrictions, discrimination, ways in which women are prevented from exercising, exercising the same rights as men, having access to the profession, owning, owing land, uh, having the right to uh, inherit from their parents, and so on and so forth. And it's mind-boggling that 90% of those countries still have it. Now, some people will say, doesn't make any difference. It's OK, we ignore. No. It does have an effect. And we have seen the case of countries, Peru being one, uh, so Somalia being another one, and a few others, where actually changing the legal system has had an impact on closing the gender gap, on <coughs> facilitating access uh, to women, for women to the economy. So starting with just the legal basis, more homework needs to be done, and presto subito. I agree. Um, let's open the floor to questions. We'll start over here. Uh, we have microphones. If you can just say your name and a brief question, the, 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 the shorter they are, the more than we can address. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. I'm the IT and Telecom Minister from Pakistan. And I just want to uh, rather make a remark here. Uh, Shamin mentioned about the uh, uh, a package that was given in Punjab in Pakistan where we enhanced the board representation. Uh, I was the woman behind the package, and Shamin knows that. And I was one woman in that entire room who was advocating for that 36-point package that we finally concluded. And I wanted to make it 50%. And the chief minister said to me, Anusha, put your dreams on the table for the women what you want. And I was one woman who was a lawyer, and I would be combated by all the men saying, oh, but, but, but you can't do this. Oh, but this is not possible. Oh, but, but we would find the 50% women. Oh, they're not there anymore. So I would say, OK, let's start with 30. And I tell you, we found the 30 without any problem in my country on the birds. So I'm going to do 50% now at the federal level, uh, made a proposal for the prime minister. And I have not found the same resistance today. Because I feel that if there is one woman in that room who can advocate for the rights of the women, 
She weighs more than all of them sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to do it collectively when we are in the position, when, they, when we are in power, to make sure that we do more for our own gender ourselves. Mm -hmm. I've started an ICT for girls program in my country. I'm training about 15,000 girls in coding and cloud computing, the poorest of the girls in the far-flung areas. And those, for me, are the most empowered girls. And this is just a policy tweaking. So this policy tweaking at the right level makes a difference. And rather than sulking and sitting and waiting for somebody to come and give us the rights that we think that we have, we have to go on and get them and support all others, whoever we can, wherever they are, through the policy interventions that we today, most of us, are in a position to do. And I tell you, my country is changing and the world is changing. And what, what Mr. Morris has just pointed out, these are precisely the reasons I feel why the women are not coming forward. I tell you, if we didn't have to bear the children and if we didn't have to look after the families, there would be no man sitting in any board position <laughs> or any chief executive of any company because we would not give them the space. Because, because, no, because from my universities and colleges in Pakistan, 70% of girls are becoming doctors. 70%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The chief minister said to me that how about uh, we were discussing that. And he shared that why aren't they working? I said, give them the environment, right. the conducive environment. They, so we made the daycare centers. So we are working on the conducive environment, a workplace where they could work. <laughs> Thank you. But essentially what I'm saying is, I'm not going to sulk. I've never sulked. And I'm the one who believe that I am the one who's going to do it. And so if I can do it, we all can do it. <laughs> Thank you Thank for sharing. You. And it will be a good problem to have next year at Davos, a, a, a panel where we need to incorporate men that are underrepresented in, in yeah. business <laughs> industries or in, in, in government. Uh, let's have one from each segment of the audience. So over there to the, to, yes, to the right, yes. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting panel. Cecilia Malmström, EU Trade Commissioner. Disrupting the, gen the status quo of gender roles is the right thing to do. We're all convinced, but there are some who are not convinced. But they might be convinced by the economic arguments, because it is good money in gender equality. And there's a lot of research showing that women in boards, that yes. fathers who take parental leaves are better leaders. There's a lot of research. How do we get out that economic argument? How can the World Economic Forum and the platform mm -hmm. you just created spread that economic to convince those who are not convinced in hearts, but who might be convinced by the economic arguments? Because gender balance makes a lot of economic sense. It has to be demonstrated in, in real life, real time. And it's, and it's something that is actually happening. When you look at, the, at, at growth, at productivity, at reduction of inequality, and you start measuring, that's at country level, it is happening. It needs to go faster, it needs to be pushed, but it is happening. At board level, you have many studies as well. But, you know, leaders in the, in, in the corporate world have to take ownership of that and realize that they're going to get, you know, more bang for their bucks if they have women sitting at the table. The, so, if I can, the yes. uh, WEF has a, a program initiative around the workforce, work, as well as gender. And we actually just met this morning as one of the stewards. And we talked about how can we get some of the academic studies even more out there. And then it goes back to then, what are we doing to hold the governance bodies accountable to push forward the issues at a corporate level or at a government level in terms of the accountability to mount and bring this to life? Because I do think there is an issue of why aren't the boards asking the question, well, if we were more diverse, we'd get better performance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have better board board performance? Now, the question is going to be, obviously, with the boards being all male, and as I said before, they don't value that diversity. They're going counterintuitive to the education, the academic studies that are there. So there is an effort underway to even do more than that. We actually said we dedicate more time and research that this coming year. Now, I would like to, yes. to add to that, because I have to go a lot of the time to convince board members to do gender parity um, programs inside of their business. So I bring a lot of business cases to them. And, I, and I'm guessing if you are here, it's because you believe in gender parity and, you are, and many of you are leaders of corporations that are doing programs. So sharing your information of how it's going and how it's succeeding is very important. 
how uh, marketing in a different way towards women, how having more women in the uh, business decision table is affecting your numbers and sharing your numbers is really important to influence other business decision makers to, to follow also. Uh, from a content standpoint, I think we talked about this initiative, it's called Fusion Fights, <laughs> concentrating on social justice um, uh, issues like gender equality. Uh, mm -hmm. I would think you know, the best example of how that can move the needle is Charmaine right here. No? Her stories have uh, created awareness around the world on the, on the importance and the, the value of gender equality. So we're aspiring to do maybe not as, as uh, great stories as, as she does, but something compelling enough to also move the needle in, in our communities, uh, especially among young people who are the, the, the key component of our audience. Over here, uh, one man, so I don't, I'm not blamed of uh, <laughs> not being for gender equality. My name is, hello, my name is Ayman, can you hear me? Yes. Ayman Tamer, I'm from Saudi Arabia, and I have two daughters born in Saudi Arabia and one boy. And I cannot agree more with you on gender equality and speeding up this. Um, I think male, one of the most important is engaging males more in this mission. Mm -hmm. Although some resistance come from females, Mothers teach their daughters in my country sometimes to maintain this inequality. Unfortunately, and I can give you thousands of examples, but the main resistance comes from the males. So if you don't engage the males, we're not gonna go anywhere. And I look at the panel and I sat on a similar panel two years ago and there was only you. This needs to change. Yes. <laughs> yes. Also, I have put quotas in my company. I insisted because when they started allowing us the regulations to hire Saudis, you have to understand that we're lagging behind the rest of the world. Women still don't drive. But we have issued a vision for 2030 yeah. where we have clearly stated that women participation in the workforce is key and women equality is not even a question. Yeah. Now getting there is the main uh, challenge. And again, I repeat, we need to engage our male ambassadors here, those who have daughters and those who care about their mothers, sisters, and daughters and wives, and who want to make a difference. And you can do it at government level and private level. When I didn't have quotas, we hired up to 300 women. Sorry, our quota's still so low, we're only 7% of our workforce. And our ambition is to reach 20, and I know that's very low under your, uh, but we're coming from a different uh, starting point. But I had to put quotas because when they, hire, they give, um, um, how do you call it, scholarships, we lost most of our talented ladies. And so they were filled by Saudis, Saudi men, not women. And so I had to put quotas to get that. I'm also a member of the Joint Commission and Employment Council, and one of the top agendas, uh, it's uh, composed of a, of a board, which reports to the Ministry of Economy and Planning, Adel Fakir, and his main mission is to create jobs. We are today 14% unemployed. We need to create 3 million jobs in Saudi Arabia. And one of the top agenda is female participation in the workforce. So again, we need to engage our men if we're going to make a difference. Especially in Puerto Rico and Saudi Arabia, we, we, we really, uh, yeah. um, very quickly, Bob, Part of the problem of getting men engaged is that most men think they, they understand gender equality, that their gender IQ is highly developed. And then you start reading, uh, it, I think it was my case, uh, even taking a few tests, uh, he, the he for she initiative does a great job on that, and then you, you realize that you're, you're not that well prepared or well documented on what gender equality means. Yeah, so the, the thing Enrique is talking about is we actually did two things for he for she, we actually put out a, a gender awareness IQ test for organizations to take a look at. And then we actually did something that we put out to the public. So not only can the public, but also people individually and then corporations and organizations to sort of test themselves in terms of how good your IQ is around this and what in fact you are doing compared to peers and compared to best practices. And we put it out there for free to try to get the awareness up again in terms of the issues. So there's economic awareness and sort of the business benefit, which Christine talked about. There's the unconscious bias and the preferences that come through and the human behavioral aspects of it. And then there's the programs and the best practices that actually have to be put in place. And then there's the individual behaviors, the human aspect that's got to bring this all to life.
Look, in, in, in many parts of the world, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, um, in, uh, you know, it's, it's this, this, this concept that we have, what are the neighbors going to say? What, are, what is the community going to say if our girls go out and work, if our girls stay out after dark? What, what you know, it's, there's a lot of societal pressure on the men uh, at home. Um, and I think that, that um, as you've been saying, that we need to get uh, men involved in the conversation. There's a, there's a wonderful example example that I love to give of a, of a woman um, in Karachi who set up a school for girls. And she went door to door um, speaking to the men and asking them why they don't let the women um, come to school. And predominantly, all the men said, we worry about what people are going to say if our girls go to school. And so the, what people are going to say is what we have to change. And she had to rationalize it and work step by step by step. And then she invited the men to come to the school once a month to see what the girls were doing. And it took a long time. But about three or four years later, okay, they, they wanted to send their girls to school. So it's a, going to be a painfully long process in many parts of the world. Um, but this, this mentality that exists has to be shattered. They're asking me to... to, to wrap things uh, up. And, and just quickly, this is the second time that I've uh, shared this quote during this week because we are uh, celebrating Ma Martin Luther King Day uh, this week in, in the United States. And my favorite quote from uh, Martin Luther, Luther King is, um, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Yeah, but we need more women helping it bend towards justice now more than ever. And I hope that uh, in the future, you know, we more male too. Yeah. <laughs> More mothers, I agree. And I hope that in the future, you know, we can uh, have a, a conversation not around how we disrupt gender roles, but how we fully uh, gain from, from a more uh, equal, uh, gender equal world. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here and to our audience. Thank you.